Well, among Indians, I would say I'm Kuia Cupeño. Among regular folks, I would say American Indian. My great-great-grandfather was the uh, war chief for the Cupeño tribe. I lived on a reservation, which was a better reservation than many, but if I had read Hobbes before, I would have said life is nasty, brutish, and short. Women got raped, people got killed, but it was my community and I suffered. We lived in a small house that my parents built. The first room I was actually born in because, of course, Indians couldn't afford to go off anywhere. By the time I grew up, there were two adobe rooms. We didn't have water. We didn't have electricity, any of the amenities. So we used kerosene lamps, which was really quite interesting. I was a little, dirty little Indian kid, like the other dirty little Indian kids. People were concerned because there was a lot of alcoholism. They didn't want their kids playing with these depraved savages. Mrs. Adams, in eighth grade, was the only teacher who ever came to the reservation. Nobody ever did that. And she came and she said in the course of a conversation, you know, that she had enjoyed teaching me and that Marigold is very, very bright. You ought to make sure she goes to college. Now, I didn't know what college was. My mother didn't know what college was. But you figure, well, it's something important. It's something that I could do, and it's something that's important enough. This person came and talked to my mother about. As far as I can remember, my mother never mentioned it again. My father, when I told him I was going away to college, said, well, when you flunk out, you can come back and we'll be here. Now, the, there's a the good part of that message, which is, when you come back, we'll be here. The bad part of it is, when you'll flunk out. And people who knew I was a straight A student, knew I was, had the IQ to do it, still said, well, you're an Indian, you can't make it. Nobody, no Indians make it in college. I was like many kids. You don't have any idea who you are, what you're doing. I was good in writing, so I went into English. Then I move into French, which is we pull a screen over that because I really had no talent in French. I then was taking a dual major, political science and psychology, and, and decided to major in political science. My very kind professor said, you shouldn't become a political scientist. They treat their women terribly. And since you can't talk, you'd be a terrible lawyer. And so I became a psychologist. Of course, I was now living off the reservation and knew rem remarkably little. It's not party conversation, but I find it's one of the universal things that's very complicated as people change cultures, is what do you do when you go to the bathroom? It's a very complicated thing because growing up in a community with no water, outdoor toilets, you suddenly have water, but you say, surely they cannot waste that much water every time you tinkle. I mean, it's just unthinkable that you should do that. Everything was traumatic and I was terrified. <laughs> I had been promised so faithfully that I was gonna flunk out. I believed I was gonna flunk out. I worked around the clock. I did nothing except study. I did not look to the right or the left. I mean, nothing. And at the end of the semester, they sent me my grades and it was straight A's. I finally got a job as a professor. You say, good deal. I mean, great job, Marigold. Nice young professor. Okay, I'd never said more than five words in public in my life. I literally, for the first semester I taught, went into the bathroom and threw up. Now, sometimes only dry heaves, but I mean, throwing up before every class. So I wrote out my lectures by hand, wrote out every word that I had to say, and then read it. Now after a while, of course, you get so you're better at that. You get so you can lecture, you get so that you are comfortable, you get so you can say witty things when you must say them, occasionally. 
Psychology always seemed very good because you could do anything. It permits you to play on a lot of fields. Perhaps the most interesting was working for a Peace Corps, so I actually got to see Africa, the Caribbean. I mean, for a little kid who basically spent their life in California, this was extraordinary. Scientifically, my greatest contribution is uh, for the last 25 or 30 years, I've been doing research on long-term memory. But when I started my study, it had been over 100 years since anybody had done a long-term study of memory on themselves. I spend probably two hours every single day of the last 35 years. So it's a very, very complicated thing. And where does that come? It, it's because Indians have a completely different time frame. Indians have a, a different sense of self and and I cannot imagine anybody else having conceived the study. At this time in my life, there's sort of the whole historical perspective. Apparently, I was the first California Indian to have walked off of a reservation and gone to a university. I continued to have terrible nightmares until I was in my mid-30s. I mean, this was not a casual thing. My nightmares had me running back into the reservation, clinging to what I knew, what I was comfortable with, and then they had me running out of the reservation into nightmare situations. And those dreams were still going on 15 years or more after I left the reservation. growing up on the reservation. Now, I could say that I have remained totally connected. The answer is no, one doesn't. One of my brilliant colleagues and I said, one of the things that's interesting about the world is that most people walk down the beach and see the beach, and other people look down and see incredible, beautiful stones and possibilities. And one of the things we have to teach people how to do is to open their minds and see the possibilities and then seize them and move on.